What's up everybody? It's a beautiful night. Tonight we're going to be talking about humic acid and phosphorus rolls. This is some pretty important stuff and how it's going to impact your seeding and overseeding plans. Let's go ahead and set the mood a little bit. Roll that intro. What's up everybody? Let's actually set the mood for phosphorus. You know, really, even the name comes from the morning star in Greek, phosphoros, if you wanted to say it all fun and be weird. That's how you'd probably do it. You know, the whole representation of phosphorus was energy, and it was noted that it had a lot of energy when white phos was initially exposed to pure oxygen. Now, when we express uh, phosphorus in fertilizer, we express it as P2O5, which is technically like a diphosphorus pentoxide not necessarily as simple as just saying phosphorus or phosphate, but also uh, phosphoric acid is sort of how it's looked at. There's all, all these different ways when we're sort of expressing it in fertilizer terms. For this particular conversation, we're going to be talking about relationships of uh, both soil, organic matter, phosphorus, phosphorus cycle, humic acid as it pertains to making phosphorus more effective in the soil system and therefore to the plant, and various roles inside of what may be the most effective phosphorus to apply to your grass. Now, first and foremost, if you look down in the description below, I'm going to put an awful lot of links, research that's been done on this over and over and over, and it dates back for a long time. And you will find consistently across the board that phosphorus is increased to the plant and to the root and in the soil system itself with humic acid applied. Now there are, as I've stated in different videos, and you can take a look also on links to other videos where I explain the differences between humic acid, humic substance, powders, liquids, all that kind of stuff. There is always a difference in what's being applied. So you really have to look at the source material of what that study is actually containing. An interesting thing that pulled up, which is like facts and myths about humic that was done out of Australia and agriculture, is they have a whole list of things. And they started out by prefacing this as humic is not a replacement for fertilizer. It never has been. That was never the intention. But most of the studies in the beginning were being used as a reason to say humic is not a replacement for fertilizer. No one in the humic industry, as far as I work with, would ever say anything to that regard. Humic in itself, especially reacted humic acid in the liquid form, is there for a very particular reason. It is a chelating agent in the soil it has the ability to unwind some of the metal ions that can bind phosphorus, especially in clay soils, is where you're going to see one of the biggest benefits, or in high CEC soils that tend to latch on and not let phosphorus go. In other places where you're going to get, say, in a more sandy medium, you have the opportunity for an awful lot of loss or leaching with phosphorus inside of that scenario and you really need to be careful about how that's applied it needs to take a measured approach and one of the things that you can take a look at is the effectiveness of granular phosphorus versus liquid phosphorus university of nebraska cooperative extension made a pretty easy thing to read about where they said uh, 12 pounds of liquid phosphorus has the same effect as 60 pounds of granular phosphorus and you are really only realizing about 8% of the granular phosphorus that you apply. We are actually seeing maybe closer to 40 and even up to 60% in your liquid phosphorus. Now, some vendors and people out there that are selling FOSS, like MAP and DAP, might say that you have 95, 90% availability. That is fine under perfect conditions, but we know that conditions are rarely perfect, if ever. It's pretty simple to state as we've done comparisons between liquids and granulars that you're always going to get a better spread, a better dispersion, and more opportunity for a seed to take hold of phosphorus through liquid rather than it can in granular. Typically, if granular is left alone, it's going to be fairly immobile. As a prill begins to melt down, it is going to dissipate and stay in a singular area. That means it's not going to necessarily have contact to the seed. So if you're looking for the best contact, you need to have your phosphorus with the seed. In agriculture, you would be putting that in furrow right along the side of the seed 
or very close by so the root can find it in a two by two setting, something along those lines. So how does humic affect phosphorus? In a number of different ways, really. You've got this complex polymeric compound that's going to come through the soil and sort of find its way down through things, release and cling certain cations, allow for some anions to grab onto it, and just sort of work its way through the soil system. Now, going back to the clay soils, oftentimes, especially in red clay areas, you're going to have high concentrations of iron, maybe you're going to have magnesium, things like that. When you get phosphorus down into the ground, it can get stuck relatively quickly. So applying humic in those situations chelates those metals away, allows the phosphorus anion to move, and now you've got it available to the plant. When you take a look at adhesion and adsorption, that's one of the things that you see the most of when applying a humic acid to the soil. And this again is reacted humic acid, not just a humic substance, and I'll get into that in a moment you are actually increasing the, available, the availability of that phosphorus to get to the plant without having the opportunity to adhere to a soil particle and become locked out, which then again is going to take some level of microbial breakdown, mineralization, so on and so forth in the phosphorus cycle. Now it's fairly consistent if you take a look at any of the links that I have provided in this video that you're going to find phosphorus uptake or phosphorus availability has been increased between 18 and 32 percent. Now that depends again on soils, what's being used, what the source medium is of the actual humic being applied, and overall you get a reading of an increase. So one of the things that we found out when we were first putting together and formulating Green Pop was that the math didn't add up when we took our source material of phosphorus and we combined it with our other humic substances in solution, we got a different reading than what was expected. What was expected was lower than what we actually came up with, and we found that we were actually unwinding more FOSS even in our source material. In the beginning, when I first started to get into the turf science of all of this, and I started to really study humic, which is now going back 20 years, there were a lot of questions, and there were a lot of claims that were a little absurd in the very beginning. Over time, things began to shift as humic began to make its way into the mainstream which it has now because of all of its benefits and because of its proven track record in the areas where you use it as a specific tool it wasn't always like that because way back in the beginning it was like I said people were trying to compare it to nitrogen which it just wasn't people were trying to compare it and replace fertility which it wasn't going to do that's not really anything like what you're going to get out of using that material. Now you are going to make everything more effective. And when I say everything, I wanna, I wanna put it to you like this. Let's say we all have an engine, an engine in a car, you're gonna go race a GT40 or something. Let's say that thing's got a thousand horsepower. It's got a thousand horsepower potential, but if you don't put the right injection system in there, if you don't put the right exhaust, if you don't put the right turbo, if you don't have the airflow to come through it, if you don't have the matching components, you're not going to get all the horsepower out of that engine. So at this point, when you take a look at, say, a granular fertilizer, a granular fertilizer is a granular fertilizer. It really doesn't matter what else you sort of throw in there. There's so much more that has been proven beyond the NPK that is the most effective in liquid forms. So using your standard granular material, it's best to have that be your pounds on the ground material, not necessarily to be something that's going to make your seed jump out of the ground unless you're planning on putting an awful lot down. The best thing I can tell you is this. You hear things, you should check the source. Take a look. Google can give you an awful lot of information, but there are researchers who have done work for the last 50, 60 years in turf grass around humic science that can actually give you the real answers, not just somebody saying something who might have something to benefit from. Now I say that a little tongue in cheek because I manufacture humic, but I manufacture humic because of the way I saw it work in my professional lawn care company, not because I thought it was a good business to get into at the time, my goal was to take care of turf, take care of turf in the best possible way. That, in my opinion, and with what I saw, even moving it into agriculture, growing row crops, soybeans, corn, wheat, tomatoes, obviously turf, 
We have been in the industry for a long time making big, big strides and showing over and over again how amazing this product can be when used how it's supposed to be. A couple of things I will always tell you is this. Looking at the source material of any study, I have maintained and I will continue to maintain that using powdered or dry humic substances aren't really going to get you very far. In this Australian study that was done, it took around 100 pounds per acre to elicit a response that was equal to half a liter per acre of liquid. Half a liter versus 100 pounds. That's a big difference. So seeing on how these things can go when you have a reacted humic substance with a good concentration compared to putting out a granular or a powder, you can't really get the reactivity out of it. Delving deeper into the humus conversation, this is something that is really only identifiable under an alkali bath. In order to see humic flush, in order to see this acid take place, it has to be broken away from the source material, and that's why and how it works well. The last thing I'm going to leave you with is this. You're probably about to get emails and alerts and all kinds of fun stuff because as of Friday morning and for the week following up into the Friday before Labor Day, there will be a sale on all of the Greene County seeding packs. We have provided a discount to our vendors on Yard Mastery, on GCI, and on the Lawn Care Nut so that you guys can get out there, follow the seeding pack, you'll have the best results you've ever had. And hey, let the proof be in the pudding. I'll talk to you guys real soon. See ya.